So uh, we're ready to get started. Um, Bob, would you like to start the program? To all people that are actually in the 1952 room in the campus center at Princeton University, and also to all those who through Zoom are tuned in, welcome. In this room, uh, we have a legacy uh, on one wall. I'm looking at uh, 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 a very famous physicist who discovered relativity. And behind me is Adelaide Stevenson, who ran for president of the United States and never did make it. We have a wonderful legacy of people that did things in the past, but uh, our present director of the campus center, uh, Marguerite Vera, lectured me on the telephone a week ago that human nature has not changed. So everyone that is tuned in has, has experience, and we want to share that experience through the preceptorial method. It'll make the living uh, legend of our of ourselves grow. And uh, Phil, with that, I turn it over to you. Well, welcome everyone. I my name is Phil Huber. I'm president of the class of 1979. Also recently become an honorary member of the class of 1952 as a result of becoming the class of 1952 preceptor. We're gonna, the, the precept will last, have a hard stop at, at one hour and we will have a standard disclaimer. The views that are presented by the two speakers, which me and my roommate, Steve Matthews, these views presented are those of the speakers individually and do not represent the position of Princeton University or any other employer or organization. We were very fortunate um, to be able to invite Steve to um, basically be the co-preceptor in a conversation uh, with me. Um, I introduced Steve, another member of the class of 1979 and my, my roommate junior year. Steve spent the year his year between um, junior and senior year in Iran. And if you think about the math of those numbers, uh, Steve was in for quite an interesting experience. So Steve, I'll just like to turn it over to you for um, just to explain a little bit of your bio and why we're so um, very fortunate to have you join us today. Sure, thank you very much, Phil. And thanks to Bob and all the others uh, on the call today uh, in this precept. Um, as Phil mentioned, you know, I, was, I, I majored in Near Eastern Studies with a focus on Iran. And I took an intervening year abroad after junior year to study in Iran with my infinite wisdom at the time. And uh, I was there during the time of the Islamic Revolution and eventually left on an evacuation plane after the Shah left in January of 79 and, the, and Ayatollah Khomeini came back in February. Um, when I got back from that interesting year, I did my senior thesis on the flow of information during the Islamic Revolution, studying, uh, you know, in, in microfilms of a microfiche in the Firestone Library of the Iranian newspapers, as well as transcripts of the foreign broadcast broadcast information service of the U.S. government of the BBC and other radio broadcasts, and also, you know, how. Uh, the, the dissemination of cassette tapes with speeches of the Ayatollah Khomeini and others was really affecting uh, the way people got information. Uh, so it was a very interesting time to be there and watching this evolution of technology, you know, the cassette tape at the time. And it kind of touches on, you know, what uh, Maria Ressa has discussed in her book and how she embraced technology as it developed from her time you know, with CNN and later on with Rappler. And so I thought it would be, you know, it's very interesting to have that, that context. Uh, after uh, school, I spent, uh, became a lawyer and uh, the last 25 years or so, I was based in the Middle East, uh, primarily in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So I've been outside the country for most of my professional career. Um, Phil, um, you know, Shall we get started to talk about well, the book? You can see why we're so fortunate to have Steve uh, join the uh, precept. Uh, the way the structure of the precept will be essentially sort of a conversation between Steve and me. 
but uh, we do we definitely invite uh, input for those of you who are attending by Zoom, and probably the best way to do it when you're ready to if you're ready to ask a question is to unmute yourself. We're using speaker view right now, so you'll be able to ask a question, and probably good to do a hand raise if you can. So Maria's book um, starts out with a chapter called The Invisible Atom Bomb. And do you talk a little bit about the both the stunning promise and the power of social media that then contrasted and became ironic with using, you know, social media to essentially being targeted by, by government? and the spread of bots and the spread of disinformation. And also, I, I thought it was interesting. I had no idea, I don't know if you did, that Philippines uh, was basically ground zero for the use and spread of social media. So Steve, what do you think? Well, yeah, it's, it's there were lots of revelations in Maria's book, uh, including you know the fact that you know, the Philippines is, is perhaps the most wired uh, country in the world. Um, you know, when she she mentions a meeting with uh, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg of Facebook, and she said that ninety seven percent of uh, Filipinos are on Facebook, and he you know then paused for a second and said, well, what about the other three percent? But uh, when you think about that, that's an amazing statistic. So, so the platform of Facebook uh, in the Philippines, you know, really is something that virtually everybody in the country was um, tapped into. And, uh, you know, that to me is, is very interesting. And, and uh, as Maria lays out in the book, more and more information started to be uh, disseminated, you know, on internet-based platforms versus traditional media, whether it's press, whether it's television, um, you know, both government uh, uh, stations and private stations. So. Um, it's interesting. What I, I I found the book interesting in one way. You could you could say it's a it's really in one sense an autobiography of this very brave uh, individual, and you know talks about her childhood in the Philippines, her coming to the U.S. at the age of uh, ten, and her experience at Princeton, and uh, really takes you through, particularly after graduation from Princeton, her, you know, decades and each decade, you know, the different things she did, the challenges she had and, and how she got through it. But it's also a, a sort of a, a roadmap on how to become a good journalist and how also to continue to do good journalism um, in the face of a totalitarian regime. And at one point, you know, she does discuss good journalism versus objective journalism. We can talk about that a little bit. But, um, you know, just very interesting to, to watch this development of her as a person and as a journalist and, and as somebody who's upholding, you know, the rights of, you know, the free press and, and trying to fight disinformation. Uh, in the Philippines and indeed throughout the world. Right. And, you know, I found in the book that it was quite challenging when she got into the deep dive of um, the, the the inner workings of um, social media. Uh, I found it shocking, frankly, that it could be so uh, profoundly influential throughout the world. Uh, she contrasted um, Ukraine and Crimea, Brexit, Catalonia, and the Stop the Steal movement. Um, it's just amazing that all of that is intertwined. But some of the lighter parts of the book were her personal biography. And I particularly loved the section when she was talking about her experience at Princeton and how um, the honor code is so deeply embedded in her life. And Steve, maybe share a little bit about what that was about. Yeah, and, and it's actually the, the header to chapter two of the book is a photograph of her pledge to uh, abide by the honor code. And, you know, after she, uh, you know, was accepted to Princeton. 
And I think for all of us who attended, I remember our class of 79 honor code assembly in Alexander Hall, and it was William Ruckel's house who had been number two in the Justice Department under Nixon. And he refused to fire uh, Archibald Cox after uh, Elliot Richardson, who had been the attorney general, had been asked to do so. Ruckel's house was asked to do so. He refused. Um, and he, he highlighted to us that day in September of 1975 the importance of honor and, and honor code and how it is essential to who you are as a member of the Princeton community throughout your life, not just your four years at the university, but forever. And what I, I liked about that is you know, Maria clearly uh, showed how important it was, again, starting the chapter with a copy of her signed uh, pledge to abide by the honor code. But I think it also sets the stage for so much of what she's done. She had a personal code of honor. You know, I think she had it, obviously, before she got to Princeton, but it enforced that sense of right and values uh, that she had. And she carried it forward um, in her professional career. And indeed, uh, when she you know, started working in television in the Philippines, um, and uh, media, you know, she and the small group of uh, colleagues, you know, quickly adopted uh, standards and a and a code of ethics to govern their organizations. And a lot of it is patterned on on the honor code. And I think that also helped uh, Maria Ressa when she was challenged, have people come to her support, both her network of close colleagues and collaborators but also human rights lawyers and others, because they knew that she had a sense of honor, there was ethics in the organization that she was working for, and they, they knew that you know, she was somebody who could be trusted um, with what she would describe to them on what she's facing, and that is so important. Oh, for sure. So the other thing that I thought was really uh, kind of interesting and fun to read uh, particularly since all of us on this Zoom are a little older than uh, Maria, is was the way uh, she had the chapter called the Golden Rule, yep. and she divided her life into decades. And it made me think about my own life in terms of decades. Um, certainly, don't have the, the kind of accomplishment that Maria has, but uh, she described her tens as discovery and exploration, twenties all the big choices that she had to make. 30s, developing expertise, 40s, um, self-described becoming a master of the universe, and then 50s, her reinvention and activism, as well as coming out. Um, do you remember that that chapter, Steve? Yes, very much so. And I think, you know, there's so many good uh, lessons in that chapter. I mean, you know, she, she says that there are, you know, three rules. One is make the choice to learn very important, and embrace your fear, learn to trust. And, and there is a little anecdote uh, that she provides and she draws upon it. She refers to it later on in the book as well. She says when she was maybe 12 or 14, she was invited to a pajama party from oh, one yeah. of her classmates. And she, her mother didn't really know what a pajama party was. They knew what pajamas were. They knew what parties were. It's a, you know, so she dressed up in pajamas and got out of the car, and all the other children are there, and they're wearing the regular daytime clothes, and she's in pajamas. And the hostess of the party went up to her, embraced her, and took her inside and helped her change into normal clothes. Fortunately, she brought a change of normal clothes. And, you know, the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them, you know, do unto to you. And, and this is very important. And, and she, she draws upon it and says, you have to, yes, embrace your fear, but learn, you got to learn to trust. You have to take that leap. And if you're fortunate, you'll have somebody on the other side whom you can trust and who will help you get over these things. And so, 
uh, it's, it's a cute little anecdote, but like I say, she refers to it later in the book uh, in reference to a challenging situation. And then the third lesson from that chapter was uh, to stand up to bullies. And, you know, very important that, you know, this is all laid out in, you know, chapter two of, of you know, part one of this book. And, and these things carry forward uh, throughout the book. Well, how about related to um, standing up to a bully, um, her statement that silence is is complicity? Well, yes, and that's that's something that uh, certainly you know, should resonate with all of us now. I mean, when when do we need to stand up and say something if we disagree with what's going on? Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, it's a very, very valid point. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, let's talk a little bit about her uh, career with uh, CNN and her rise within CNN, um, particularly how she learned um, basically to be really effective at live reporting. It occurred during a coup, right? Um, and and Mar Maria demonstrates her bravery, not only in her willingness to be arrested and to serve prison time, but physical uh, bravery as well by um, you know, essentially avoiding snipers during that coup. Remember that part? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I will say that, you know, she is she is not alone. Uh, there are, I had the fortune of meeting another CNN journalist uh, who was head of the uh, India Bureau of CNN a number of years ago, and um, Anita Pratab is her name, and she covered the war in Sri Lanka with the Tamil Tigers, and you know she went in behind you know, behind the lines, and she was the first one to have an interview with uh, the Tamil Tiger leader uh, Prabhakaran um, on behalf of uh, uh, CNN or Time. She was working for both at, at different times. But, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, the bravery and, and, you know, Maria's experienced it, Anita Ratab experienced it, and there's many other journalists uh, throughout the world who, you know, this is part of their job today. They have to go in and face these issues. And it's, it's not at all easy, and they have to have ex incredible strength and a support network to help them. Uh, the other thing uh, from that chapter, Phil, is, is in her 20s, she basically you know, worked 18 to 20 hours a day. And it's amazing. She was really holding two full-time jobs, you know, working at CNN and working you know, with, with uh, Time or another network trying to get it you know, set up. Uh, I mean, the amount of effort she put in learning how to do production, learning the craft of journalism, presenting. I mean, so much that she did in you know, that uh, decade, uh, it's really two decades worth of work or more for any normal human being. The other uh, part of, of her uh, experience at, at uh, CNN, she talked about her two biggest stories uh, that she broke. And one was on uh, basically Al-Qaeda and Islamic terrorism and the link to the Philippines. I didn't know anything about that. Um, and then the other big breaking story was she essentially was able to prove the um, social media use of uh, essentially information warfare. And, you know, the world was essentially blindsided by that. Yeah, no, those are two, you know, great uh, reveals in the book. And, and certainly, you know, since I was in the Middle East and we were, you know, Al Qaeda was active when I was uh, living in uh in in you know very active uh when i was living in the region i was actually in saudi arabia at the time of uh on 9 11 um and you know later i had to leave in 2004 right after our 25th reunion three weeks later i i uh left the kingdom because of uh al-qaeda uh terrorism uh going on you know in in the country at the time it, it had gotten very bad and i you know, I lost uh, eight or ten people who were friends, clients, or acquaintances in in the space of uh, a year and a half. 
um, to the terrorism. It's it was you know very real. Um, but yeah, she did you know got down and you know tracked Al Qaeda's efforts uh, in the late nineties. Um, and what I think a lot of people don't realize is the Philippines actually has a fairly sizable Muslim minority, primarily in the south of the country, Mindanao and, and the southern region has a significant Muslim population. But you talked about Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who, you know, we have we have certainly seen and heard a lot about him uh, over the last 20 some odd years and how he was active and uh, others um, of Al Qaeda and Abu Sayyaf um, in the Philippines uh, during that time, and and yes, this was just a few days after 9/11 that she was able to connect these dots. Uh, pretty amazing bit of investigative journalism, right? And you know, this sort of leads us into um, her section of the book, which is based on the rise of Facebook, the establishment of Rappler, and what Maria calls the internet's black hole. Now, I will say that Maria's book is not all gloom and doom about social media. Um, she does talk about, um, you know, essentially that there can be a tipping point based on citizen journalism programs um, that that rose as a result of um, oh, to one of the one of the massacres uh, in the Philippines, and then. She talked about the the power of participatory media. So it's not all negative stuff with misinformation and lies and you know shocking things. It also has the power to sort of create these groups who are really doing you know very positive uh, media and journalism. No, that's correct, and I think you know we saw that you know in our own country recently, in you know in Minnesota with the, uh, the Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, you know, the, the brave bystander who recorded the, the police, um, you know, uh, uh, with a knee on the neck of George Floyd um, and how that, you know, was viewed by millions, millions across the country and across the world. And, you know, that's, that shows you the power of a phone. And yes, she talks about, you know, using those new technologies, getting getting the leap on the likes of CNN, who were still relying on old cassette, you know, video technology, et cetera, and, you know, versus being able to stream something live. So yes, yeah, she's uh, she talks about that in an encouraging way, but also educating the population, the public, to become as you 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 know, quote unquote, citizen journalists. And in connection with one of those uh, coup attempts. She she says you know there's a photograph of of you know some of the uh, some massacre, and she determined that it probably came from one of the government soldiers who was there and who just said enough is enough I've got to get this out there, um, you know very interesting ability to take you know an image and get it everywhere um, almost instantaneously. For sure. So um, I'm going to ask a brief administrative question. Marguerite, on that laptop, do we see all the squares? No, you're seeing that, but there's, I can see. I can I'm see. just, because we don't see all the squares if someone is going to ask a question. So Steve, um, do you remember the part in the book when she talks about how she um, created the name Rappler? Yeah, it was a combination of rap and uh, ripple. Ripple, exactly. Yeah. Ripple effect. And ripple meaning uh, making waves. Making so waves. I just thought that was very, um, very creative. Also interesting um, with Rappler, um, the way that they experimented initially uh, with Facebook. And they were very optimistic about what Facebook could do for both Philippines and um, democracy. And then it also, you know, the, the positive irony of how social media sped up the Arab Spring. And then it evolved to be so destructive to democracy. And did anyone see that coming? 
I certainly didn't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it happened very, very quickly, very quickly. And, and you may recall that, you know, some 10 years ago when there were uh, uprisings in Iran, this was during the Obama administration, you know, there were sanctions imposed, but uh, very carefully, the U.S. government did not sanction companies in the telecom space and providing equipment that could be used by the public to, uh, you know, social media uh, was permitted to function with the view that, you know, the regime could not be as oppressive if the public could communicate on these platforms. And that was a very significant carve out from the export control sanctions imposed on Iran at that time. That's right. And, you know, the, I had to take a note because when I was reading the part that was the deep dive of the misuse of social media, I got kind of lost. But I did write down, you know, there was the evolution of platform business models. So this was money that was based on, on this. Um, then got co-opted by state power, turned against people, fueling digital author authoritarians, death of facts, and insidious mass manipulation. It's kind of depressing, huh? It's, uh, yeah, very depressing. And, you know, she does go into some detail on the business model. You know, if you, she compares, you know, even some of the, the television networks she worked for the fact that the business side of the network was separated from the news uh, division, which is, is the norm in the U.S. in most, you know, CBS, for example, they've long had a, a distinct line between the news division and the entertainment and business division, uh, so that the, the news division has independence. And... Uh, you know, she talks about, you know, resigning from the position at ABS that she had uh, when there was pressure to bring back an anchor who had been the vice president under Duterte, I think, and had before that, you know, been, a, been the lead news anchor on that station. And she really went to a meeting after resisting it and was being pressured to uh, accept his return, and she resigned from the network over that. She said, nope, right. we, we can't, uh, I just can't be part of this because we need to have that independence right. from, the government, from influence, so, the business. I want to ask you a question, Steve. Um, Maria talks about the three stages of degradation of online information ecosystems. First, the buildup of campaign machinery. Second, the commercialization of new online black ops, and then the consolidation of power at the top and polarization. Do you know what an online black op is? What I understood it to mean is, you know, she gave the, an example such as, uh, you know, the Cambridge Analytical uh, uh, scandal that broke a number of years ago. And that's where, uh, you know, people, you know, will you know create these these bot bot farms and and other uh you know ways of manipulating media you know she talks in detail about algorithms how they're used on facebook and elsewhere to accentuate you know hate and anger and and other things and friends of friends of friends can be influenced far more than you know just your own circle of friends using these algorithms and it's not just Facebook, you know, a, a lot, you know, Twitter and, or now X, uh, YouTube and, and uh, TikTok, you know, are all relying to one degree or another on these algorithms to amplify uh, the effect that they have, the number of inboxes that receive updates or whatever uh, of the friends of friends of friends. Um, but how, you know, companies would come in, be recruited, by political parties and others to go into places such as the Philippines and create this infrastructure to disseminate whatever the government or the party wanted uh, uh, to be seen as a message. Um, you know, she mentioned, you know, Philippines uh, for one, but uh, reference also, as you said, to Brexit, to uh, the BJP in India. 
uh, in more recent times, et cetera. So uh, we're at the uh, halfway point of our um, precept seminar. And I just want to maybe pause for a second to see if anyone has a question or a comment to make who's um, attending this in Zoom, or we've got a couple of 79ers here in the conference room. Anybody have a question? Don't be shy. This is a precept, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I have a comment. Um, what I thought was interesting was that Maria talks about developing that amplification process as something to make sure people read the good stuff well, and how it got turned around to being getting the bad stuff. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, that's why I sort of made the statement that it, it wasn't all gloom and doom um, in, in her book. I mean, there was some pretty optimistic um, initiatives that, that Rappler has taken. It, um, Steve, do you remember the acronym FUD, F-U-D? Yep, I've written it down uh, and it-, it <laughs> We probably uh, took the same fear, notes. Yeah, it's uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And she writes that it was a tactic used by, you know, computer companies such as IBM and Microsoft in the 90s. And uh, the use of, you know, fictitious social media accounts um, and, and then she talked about her Shark Tank database that she said, and this is where, you know, it was so fascinating. She goes into this deep dive. She is studying, you know, big data, you know, their, uh, the, the technical mastery that she and her team have in terms of understanding this thing called social media. Uh, and the new information ecosystem was, was really eye-opening and, and, you know, and she describes how, you know, we could stand up to people trying to push back because we had the facts, we had the information, we could show that this piece of disinformation that was being circulated in connection with a, a, a coup attempt was actually a photo taken and published six months ago. And here it is, here we sent it out, we put it out there. Uh, but it was you know, very interesting, though, that that deep dive and understanding of the technology. And she's got diagrams in the book, the mapping of the, you know, the, the pro uh, op you know, opposition candidates and then the pro Duterte and pro uh, uh, Bang Bang Marcos candidates, for example. And, you know, the number of hits, the number of, uh, you know, messages then being sent out from these different sites and these, you know, talks at one point about 26 fake uh, accounts and how they, you know, sent out millions, millions of messages. Well, and she, one of her discoveries was that one fake um, Facebook account can reach as many as three to four million people. And that's yeah. almost instantly. It's just amazing. It's funny when you mentioned the charts that were in her book. Um, I remember that section of the book. It made me think back to uh, the mistake I made of taking uh, chemistry 203 before I had even taken chemistry 101. <laughs> and I spent the whole semester just being completely confused. That's how I felt about her charts. <laughs> but um, anyways. I, I, yeah, I, I saw them. I said, well, there's there's evidence here. I can I can see the graphic representation. I don't fully understand it. And I'm hoping <laughs> I was hoping we had some members of, you know, uh, the current uh, undergraduate class on who, who might understand all of this better than you know, those of us from 79 and 52. Right. So how about the fact that um, Facebook possessed the data that basically proved that lies were being spread by the far right, but chose to do nothing because of their business model. Yeah, and that's that's a very disturbing element of the book. And you know, I you know, she mentions she distinguished Facebook from some of the other tech companies again based on the business model. She said, you know, Google and others would separate the biz the the news side from the business side. Uh, information. And uh, to that point, I just read in one of the papers yesterday or today that a lot of the tech companies are now 
uh, decoupling from news networks um, and getting them off because of, of you know, uh, disinformation and and uh, some of what's going on. So maybe, you know, her book and her, her winning of the Nobel Peace Prize uh, has helped uh, educate some folks that uh, otherwise we did not see any any you know great impacts that should be expected from what she's written here. Yeah, and you know the other part of the, at least for me, the sort of yeah, I must admit that um, I still find it hard to believe that people are actually truly influenced by social media. Yeah. Um, but I it's I think it's part of the whole echo chamber that people seek out what they want to believe. And um, I think most of us Princeton alums probably don't get our <laughs> information from Facebook. We might use it for fun, like class of 79. But I thought it was related to all this, where Maria talks about the Facebook decision to deprioritize news. And they, she writes the statement that their decision was to drive engagement through comments and discussions, not shares and likes. Remember that part? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but that, of course, then, you know, while it may seem to be the right thing in in a, what well, an even playing field, what happened is, you know, that refocus uh, kind of led to people uh, focusing on the negatives, fear, anger, hatred, rather than the positives, good news, uh, uplifting stories, uh, what have you. Um, and uh, yeah, it's you know, it was certainly you know one of those things. The negative of human nature sometimes uh, takes over uh, the positive sides and. Uh, Seem to really think that was Facebook's deliberate decision to deprioritize news and to change the way people engaged, and that that's what resulted in more hate, toxicity, and fake news. You know, there's no accountability there. It's just I, I find it beyond shocking. Yeah. Um... And, you know, I'd like to have input from others who are closer to social media and computer science, you know, way in here as well, um, if, if, if we have any on the call. Yeah, I, I think that we're, uh, we're all older than Maria. Let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> I have an observation. Please. That that's old news. Okay, Twitter is now the king of misinformation or disinformation with all the changes made by uh, Elon Musk. Uh, it's been in the news lately that someone, there's people that track these things and uh, Twitter is now it's full of, you know, fake fake pictures. Now you can put fake heads on, on bodies and uh, there were pictures, there were uh, pictures of some soccer player uh, holding a Palestinian flag, and um, I forget his name, but he's some famous soccer player. Right, right, right. So you can fake the pictures and post them, and, and then Twitter has fewer filters now than even Facebook did. So I don't know a way out. Yeah, she was. She's kind of like warning us. It's like she's a, warning us. That's right. Like a warning. Um, so, by the way, speaking here um, in the class of 1952 room is Prentice Hall, another fellow 79er, and he's our class vice president, soon to be class president. Glad you spoke up. <laughs> you know, there's three rules of the preceptorial. One is come, come prepared, and come prepared to talk. There you go. So I get two of those three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, if, if I can chime in as somebody who was in the IT industry in, in, during my day um, and try to keep up with social media, thank you, Roarcor at, at Princeton, we also have to recognize that the platforms keep changing. I agree with, with Prentice what he said, that, that 
Twitter now X is the platform, but you know many of other generations. Facebook is for us older folks, and Facebook is a non-entity for the current folks. You know, they've moved on to other platforms. They've moved on to Snapchat. They've moved on to Instagram. This, you know, Facebook is minor, but what can you do with those other platforms? Exactly what Prentice said. They've always had the capabilities of altering what you see. So Gary, you'll be very proud of me that I have now taken three selfies <laughs> and I've posted something on Instagram. Yes, I am very proud of you, Phil. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, Steve, um, <clears throat> the first read of Maria's book was in for me was I it was in August when we were on vacation, and she spoke about her very close friendship with Twink. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know about you, but the first time I read Twink's last column when she was dying of cancer, it brought me to tears. I, I found that section to be just unbelievably moving. And her last column, again, I took a note, but basically she stated that Filipino pe people can get better, can choose to get better and deserve better. And the very heart of me, meaning herself, remains unbreached, and she will fight. Um, just a, I thought, just a very, very powerful statement by Maria's best friend, who was about to die. Yeah, no, that was very moving, and I recall that you know she repeated, she copied out. It's about you know a page or a half a page, and it's in italic type. Um, and she, Maria is writing this and in the middle, she says, you know, when I get to the following section, I always cry. It's very emotional. But uh, the other uh, thing that really moved me here is Maria was being, you know, Twink had been her friend from grade school. And at one point, Maria was being attacked in the Philippines and accused of being Indonesian, not Filipino. And uh, Twink writes, and there's copies of these these text messages or or posts in the book. You know, someone saying, you know, Maria is uh, Indonesian. She's not even Filipino, and therefore, you know, we we shouldn't be following her and paying attention to her. Um, and Twink says, no, she and I were classmates in you know for several years at X Y Z school, and I've known her all my life. For father was killed or mother moved to the states uh remarried and then she came back and gave that and, and defended her again with facts and you know, the the other big takeaway I, I got out of the book is the importance of building these small networks of friends who collaborated who shared a vision and values and trusted one another, helped each other through thick and thin, and how much they could do, whether it was at the ABS uh, channel, whether it was CNN, whether it was Rappler, uh, this small network of hardworking people collaborating and how they can change their world. Uh, that was another big takeaway of the book. You know, wasn't Maria doing this on her own? It was Maria the incredible strength she had and the honor code and everything else that, that drove her. But the fact that she had this collaborative small network that helped her go forward and how to the end. And that's why, you know, when, when Twink is dying and writing her, you know, her last message and also talking about, you know, she really, you know, doesn't want to have a funeral, but she wants to have a wake. She wants to have a party. Everybody should have a party for me. Now I understand. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of the uh, Philippine um, tradition of basically lying in an open co coffin for nine days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the strength of that network, and then again, I, I think that is such a big takeaway here. And, you know, it's not just limited to, you know, what Maria 
and her colleagues were doing in journalism, but that that holds true for you know, people in you know the tech industry. You think about you know Steve Jobs and and folks and uh, Bill Gates and uh, you know his early collaborators. You know small groups who can move mountains when they share a a vision and collaborate and trust one another. And how about Maria's relationship with Amal uh, Clooney? Yes, uh, obviously, you know, Amal Clooney wrote the the preface to the book, and and she's close to Maria. And you know, there is an interesting story when Maria, you know, toward the end of the book, she's talking about you know the prosecution she's facing, and uh, talking to Amal Clooney about you know how do you want me to be involved? You want me to be involved at my you know, NGO level at a very high level, or do you want me to be involved as your legal counsel? And she describes how she later became her legal counsel and how she, you know, helped to orchestrate, you know, working with local lawyers and other supporters in the Philippines, how to, you know, uh, help her to defend herself in these criminal cases and tax cases and other cases brought up against her and Rappler in the Philippines. So yeah, I also, very, very important. I also loved in that section of the book um, what basically, I mean, this just shows what a, you know, you know, not to be trite, but what a badass Maria is. Um, her statement in all caps, I'm not like them, meaning everyone that was attacking her. Um, and also she talks about what her North Star is and which is based around building communities of action. So pretty powerful and positive message, I thought, by someone who's just being well, uh, essentially terrorized. You mentioned the honor system at Princeton. So it's more, it, it's also involving uh, what she believes is is important. Oh, for sure. And, and Steve, didn't you love how she described the uh, Nobel Peace Prize notification? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, very interesting, very interesting. Um, you know, immediately giving credit to her team. Um, obviously, she's extremely honored um, by the award. And, and I think that she wasn't completely surprised because she knew she was on the short list. Yeah, but again, as you say, giving credit to the team, and that's why, you know, that one theme that comes out throughout the book is the importance of, to me, when I read of that small collaborative trusting team and, you know, being able to move mountains. And, and again, go back to the honor code. People were willing to come to her support because they knew she had honor. They knew if she said, this is a fact, it is a fact. And, you know, they didn't worry about, uh, you know, any professional blowback or, or otherwise um, in terms of, you know, what she communicated to them to be the facts of the case. The, um, we have a few minutes uh, remaining, I, the, the, probably the concluding um, couple of minutes, I, I'd like to speak about how one actually does stand up to a dictator. But before that, I thought she gave um, essentially prescriptions to, to solving this. But I, w within her prescription, I actually wonder whether uh, a democracy and a capitalist system would actually be able to implement these, although it seems like Europe is. But her three pillars to address these issues, first is to demand accountability from technology. And that would require government action. Um, she states the protection and growth of investigative journalism. And lastly, her North Star, which is essentially building larger communities of action. What did you take from that, Steve? Well, I uh, take the first of the three, you know, the accountability of the technology platforms, you know, the big uh, tech companies. Um, and, and here you're right, you know, the Europeans are ahead of the U.S. and the rest of the world here. They implemented a number of years ago the General Data Protection Law, which covers data privacy, GDPR, and GDPL. And um, 
it has the ability to find companies that violate it uh, up to, I think, 4% or 6% of gross worldwide revenues, a very hefty potential fine uh, for violations of, of privacy. And, you know, she talks about in the book how, you know, people harvested uh, private information from Facebook and, uh, you know, use that and how fines were assessed against uh, Facebook and I think other media companies as well, or uh, tech companies. She also describes how, you know, Facebook itself received a $5 billion fine from the U.S. Federal Trade Commission um, as uh, arising from the Cambridge analytical scandal where data was harvested from millions of Facebook's accounts. And uh, and there she talks about uh, earlier on in the book how, you know, other tech companies had checks and balances. She said at Facebook, anybody working for Facebook would have access to all private information. There were no filters, no screens. So if you were working for Facebook, you had access to the the data on any Facebook user. And she said that that was not the case at Google and other platforms. So, uh, you know, really, really came down hard on Facebook. Um, and that's the first one is if there are some laws in place. The U.S. has been slower in implementing things like the GDPL, but uh, you know, it's happening. Uh, the U.S. is, is uh, at the federal level as well as state level. We're now seeing data protection laws, and I think there'll be more activity in this space. Um, in terms of, you know, the third one, creating communities of action, well, that's, again, right now, it's all empowerment and getting more and more people to stand up, use their telephones, a la what we saw with George Floyd in Minnesota, you know, get that video, get it out there um, and and use it to uh, push back on uh, perceived you know, abuses in your own communities. You know, the other thing that I found remarkable about Maria and her, her memoir is how much stuff she gets done. You know, That's amazing. She's talking about international travels, you know, South Africa, Europe, South Asia. I mean, she's all over the place. And at the, at the same, and she's got to go through hoops to get permission to be able to travel because she's un, under indictment. And she, in some respects, she kind of, her ability to get so many things done by just one person, it reminds me, you know that Dr. Um, Paul Farmer? who did that uh, unbelievable work in Haiti. It's just a, a super doctor, superhuman, and much, much like uh, Maria. It just, uh, it, I don't know, it sort of makes me feel like I don't get much done. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let's uh, spend the last few minutes to talking about how what it takes to stand up to a dictator. And um, her first component was to embrace uh, values, meaning honesty, vulnerability, empathy, moving away from emotions, embracing one's fear, and mm -hmm. believing in the good. Pretty powerful stuff. I suspect that her Nobel Peace Prize is probably helping keeping her out of jail. Um, you know, but uh, what courage it takes to embrace those values. Yeah, and, uh, you know, she's done it admirably um, throughout her her career. Uh, I mean, and, you know, she goes from challenge to challenge and get stronger each time. And she does, you know, make reference to the old phrase, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And certainly, you know, the, the 30 years of her career, that certainly resonates when you read the book. She just gets stronger and stronger. Yet those core values, again, that honor code, that hard wiring of honor and trust, uh, 
I think, you know, carries her forward. And then the ability, you know, to embracing uh, fear, being willing to get out of the comfort zone and change things and confront um, and get things done. Um, uh, that's, you know, really, to me, you know, very, very important and has helped her to achieve so much. And indeed helps others achieve. If you get out of your comfort zone, uh, and and this goes back to her experience at, at Princeton, which I love. You know, she she started out as a pre med. She finished all her her pre med prerequisites in the first two years, and then suddenly she embraces drama and these other things. And uh, it, it it's a great story about how Princeton provides these opportunities. Um, and you know, but and you can just see that thread continue uh, over the next 30 years. You know, Maria um, gave one of the um, Alumni Day presentations uh, two Alumni Days ago, and it was just, a, you know, it was obviously a very moving uh, presentation, huge standing ovation at the end. Um, and, you know, how fortunate we are as Princeton alums that we can count on Maria Reza as uh, as one of our own. The other aspect about standing up to a dictator in that chapter was when Maria spoke about the social media platforms and she stated directly, your business model has divided societies and weakened democracies. They knew it and they didn't listen. And she has at the end of that chapter, I think it's the, it may be the last sentence, quote, unquote, violence has made Facebook rich, unquote. Yeah. Pretty, pretty damning stuff. So uh, I will say that um, for those who are on the Zoom and, and watch the recording later, if you haven't read the book, um, at the least, I would get it. Her first chapter summarizes the whole book. I didn't realize that until I read the book a second time. So if you read the first chapter and then you read, I think it's the prologue where she and her co-Nobel Peace Prize winner, they basically outlined in their Nobel um, presentation um, a 10 point plan to basically address uh, um, this issue. So, um, if there are no other questions, we're kind of at the concluding point. This uh, precept is recorded. We'll make it available um, online. It'll certainly be on the class of 1979. And uh, the class of 1952. Yeah. Basically. Do you have a YouTube channel? We don't have a YouTube, but, oh. we, we, but we have a, a your website. Website. Yeah. So it'll be on the 79 YouTube channel. and. Um, I just want to thank those of you who were able to participate for joining us. Um, I hope you found this to be an interesting presentation. And we owe Steve a big applause for his insight into this. For and sure. Bob, would you like to make some remarks as the founding? I want to, I want to thank Phil and, and, and uh, Steve for the academic excellence that you brought to the subject. There are other aspects that Maria did not go into as far as uh, dealing with dictators is concerned, one of which is religion and theocracy. Uh, and there are other there are other things. This gives us the opportunity now that we have a uh, preceptors uh, that can lead us uh, to take other deep subjects and using our experiences that go all the way from people uh, that are, have just graduated, like uh, 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 Solomon, who, who, who wrote about change, uh, to people like Jim Baker, who from experience said to in this particular room, in this particular spot, 
uh, Mr. Putin has done a great thing to make uh, NATO uh, more active. There are uh, many, many things that we can bring our collective experiences together to think about, and I thank you both for showing us the way. Thanks, everybody.